we continue our video project and today I'm going to tell you about four interesting papers which recently appeared in the archive. Let me switch to them. So, the first one is uh, dedicated to gravitational microlensing. So, for the first time, people were able to discover a triple system with uh, this technique. This is quite remarkable um, because um, quite many times um, binary systems have been discovered. Also, there are discoveries of stars with planets. Even um, there was a discovery of a star with two planets. Uh, but a triple stellar system is discovered for the very first time. This is really quite interesting. And what I like is that the picture is really nice. Because um, in the gravitational microlensing, uh, the light curve, uh, due to this effect, can have a very strange shape in many cases, even in binary systems. So it's not just two simple peaks. Uh, there can be other interesting details in the light curve and it can um, have a very complicated shape. But in this case, we really see tzak, 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 three peaks. And uh, the system consists of three stars of uh, comparable masses, all below the solar mass, which is uh, not, not a miracle because low mass stars are more abundant in the universe. So it's a very beautiful, very clear result and it demonstrates the ability of the microlensing to discover such systems. Uh, why it happened for the first time? Because the system has a rather peculiar structure. You see, what's the uh, trick here? If we have a lensing on a source, say on a star, then to see other components, we need them to be close together. Um, and uh, it is not easy to fulfill this condition because triples and uh, other multiple systems, they have a hierarchical structure. So if you see a star, it's quite probable to see mm, the second star, to, to find the binary. But to see the third component, uh, you really need some luck, because in stable systems, the third component most probably would be far away. And uh, then the effect will not be visible on that component. And oppositely, if you see an effect on the third component, you do not see the first two components. So actually many uh, microlensing events on, say, single stars, we think that they are single stars, are actually um, events on binaries or even triple uh, systems, but we just do not see other components in that system. But here, uh, all three stars are really close together. And uh, I really wonder uh, about the real geometry of the system, because in the microlensing, of course, you have a momentary um, picture of that system in projection on the sky. So you do not know the complete 3D structure of um, the system. And it's quite interesting to know what's the real structure of this particular system. Um, is it stable um, on a long time scale or not? Quite interesting. Well, uh, let's move on. Um, another result about um, binaries, okay, in the first case it was a triple system, but let's generalize it to multiple systems. Um, this is again a very tricky system. Um, you know that um, there are many binary systems with accreting black holes, and we know lots of them. However, when initially in the 60s people started to discuss how it is possible to discover a black hole in a binary system, there was quite a clear idea. It was put forward by Gusainov and Zeldovich, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, generally it's quite simple, but it was important to apply it to black holes. So the, the idea is like that. Uh, for quite a long time, and uh, you know that the first uh, idea about the white dwarf, the um, 
secondary component of the SIR system. Um, quite a long ago, people realized that you can discover invisible components in binary systems just looking at Doppler shifts of um, velocity, of the line of sight velocity of the visible component. So we obtain a spectrum of the star, we measure spectral lines, then we obtain um, the spectrum days after weeks, years after we compare them, and we see that lines are moving. And this is a periodic shift. This is uh, due to a simple fact that the star is a member of a binary system, or maybe of a triple and so on, and it rotates around the center of mass of the system. So half of um, its period, of its orbital period, it's moving towards us, um, another half from us, and we see this Doppler shift. And uh, as far as we know the orbital period, we know the velocity amplitude, we know the mass of the visible star, we can estimate or in some cases really precisely calculate the mass of the secondary component. In case of white dwarfs, it is something below at least 1.4 solar masses. You know, the typical white dwarf masses are about 0.6 solar masses. If it is more massive, then it might be a neutron star. But if it is really massive, say 8 solar masses or 10 solar masses, then it might be a black hole because a star with a mass 8 solar masses is a very bright source. And uh, if we see one star with, say, one solar mass, but we don't see the secondary component, which is actually a primary, the second component, uh, which has a mass about 8, 10, 15 solar masses, then the only reasonable idea is that that component, the invisible one, is a black hole. So that was, um, again, that was proposed um, long ago, more than 50 years ago. Uh, but this method didn't work for quite a long time, say up to now. And only recently people started to discover such systems with um, dormant black holes and neutron stars. And of course, white dwarfs, but for white dwarfs we know. Uh, for black holes and neutron stars, this is quite interesting to discover such systems. And uh, in this paper, the authors uh, study in detail one of uh, candidates and they obtain a very precise uh, information about the visible star and uh, they make new spectroscopic observations so they precisely uh, calculate the mass of the invisible component. So the visible star is a red giant. In the middle panel of the picture you see the hirschsprung crassel diagram and uh, you see the normal uh, main sequence and uh, the giant branch. That's the main sequence at the giant branch. And uh, this red star um, corresponds to the visible component. And by itself, you see that component on the left um, figure. On the right, you see parameters of the star. Uh, the temperature is uh, below 5000 um, Kelvin. And the radius of the star is close to eight solar radii, so it's a giant, as you see. And uh, the authors obtain an, uh, an estimate, a very precise estimate, of the mass of the black hole. It's about nine solar masses, so no doubt that in this case we are dealing with a system with a dormant black hole. Why it is dormant? Also, you can uh, remember that uh, red giants actively uh, lose their mass um, because of strong stellar wind. Uh, the wind can be very intensive and also it's very slow, so it's quite easy to capture it. But uh, the accretion is not effective because the system is very wide. The orbital period is um, above uh, three years in this case. And uh, so uh, no significant accretion disk is formed around the black hole. So the authors also um, looked for possible X-ray emission from the black hole, but they didn't discover anything. So quite an interesting system. But let's move to two papers which really uh, are covered in news. So the first one, um, it is about those remarkable uh, disk-like galaxies in early universe identified in one of the first um, James Webb telescope images. 
Uh, as you remember, um, the, one of the first and most famous results of the James Webb telescope is the following. Uh, it came out that uh, in, in the early universe here, of course, we're not speaking about first minutes or seconds, we're speaking about uh, redshifts about three, five. Um, in this epoch, uh, people see, or let's say they uh, thought that they see, uh, lots of disk galaxies. And uh, this is not uh, well compatible with existing models of uh, galaxy formation. However, in this paper, uh, the authors redo the job. Actually, uh, that's very important. When we are dealing with such things like uh, identifying faint galaxies in the first James Webb telescope images, it's a very tricky thing. It, it's not like that, that you look at an image and you see something like an Andromeda galaxy. Um, so what people see, they see um, that there are galaxies, they are elongated, so they look like they are um, disk galaxies. However, uh, of course, people uh, didn't obtain detailed uh, spectra of these galaxies and so on. So in this paper, the authors took um, computer simulations, TNG50, and in the image you see galaxies, synthetic galaxies calculated with this uh, software. And uh, they uh, reproduced, synthetically reproduced uh, observations of these simulated galaxies. And uh, they realized that many galaxies which are not actually disk galaxies would be classified as disk galaxies in such images when you just um, use the uh, usual visual technique. So you look at the galaxy and you classify it. And uh, this is quite interesting because uh, it is quite possible that actually there is no problem with these disk galaxies at uh, z equal 3 or even in earlier epochs. And um, what does it mean? It uh, means, in my opinion, that uh, new studies are necessary. So, uh, and definitely people were thinking about it even before the paper, that uh, it is necessary to uh, look more attentively at these galaxies most probably with the same James Webb telescope. Uh, it's a very powerful instrument. And really to identify their nature, to understand if uh, they are really disk galaxies or uh, they have a different nature. And uh, then uh, there'll be no significant contradiction with the uh, um, present day computer simulations of uh, the galaxy formation. But still, I want to underline that, of course, we do not think that the present day calculations are 100% precise, accurate, and so on. Uh, it's quite obvious that um, these computer models uh, will be advanced in future. That's one point. And then, of course, observations are necessary to test these models. If we have perfect models, then we do not need something like the James Webb Telescope. So it's a quite an interesting um, deviation of the story. But now we are coming to a complete new story. And that's the paper by Farah and uh, co-authors. And um, most probably you already heard about it. That's about uh, black holes, dark energy, and so on. So people propose that they explain everything in, in one go. So um, what's the idea in a nutshell? On one hand, there are many theoretical models uh, about black holes in the expanding universe. Um, there are some theoretical problems how you put together a normal, for example, care black holes and um, Friedman universe, expanding universe. So people were working on it, and there are many different theoretical solutions. In some of these solutions, so uh, let's underline, all of them are, say, hypotheses, uh, theories in, in, in that sense. Um, so 
one family of these solutions predict that black holes are sensitive to the expansion of the universe. These are uh, very peculiar solutions because uh, black holes do not have a normal internal structure uh, like you've read in uh, most of popular books and even not popular books. Uh, so still, we do know how um, black holes look uh, inside. Um, and so we can make different models. So in some of these models, they uh, are linked to the dynamics of the universe. And how they are linked? They are increasing their mass. So as the universe expands, black hole grows. This is a very remarkable thing. What's the rate of growth? Uh, in the model, you can obtain different values. But in this picture, you see that the coefficient uh, in the power is equal to 3. So if the scale factor grows by a factor of 2, then uh, the mass of a black hole during that time grows by a factor of 8, so 2 power 3. This is quite a significant growth. And uh, also you have to take into account that as the universe expands, the spatial density of black holes goes down, yeah? like, uh, normal, like for normal matter, like for dust. Uh, galaxies and so on. Uh, but if black holes increase their mass um, proportionally to the cube of the scale factor, then two effects uh, compensate each other. Then how it can be? The, uh, it is necessary in these models that um, in this case, uh, this process um, produces negative pressure. And negative pressure is a feature of the dark energy. So somehow there is a theoretical concept. Um, I cannot judge if uh, it is perfect uh, in a sense that there are no internal contradictions, but um, there is a theoretical concept um, that uh, such things can happen, that uh, the universe expands, black hole grows, and as they grow, they produce the effects similar to the dark energy. Okay, that's one um, part, uh, the theoretical one, uh, let's put it aside. Uh, then the observational part. This year, um, Farah and collaborators published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal, so a remarkable um, journal, um, in which they studied uh, black hole masses in elliptical galaxies. And they demonstrated an interesting feature, again, underlined. They studied some sample of galaxies, so galaxies of some particular type, and the sample is not extremely big. So um, the effect is like that. Um, they found out that black hole masses grow by a significant factor, about 10, 20, so since uh, redshift about 3. But the stellar mass of these galaxies doesn't grow. So it, it is possible to uh, explain it um, by a purely astrophysical scenario. So definitely um, you can do it. Uh, it can be tricky, but still, even if we believe in this data, yeah? So we put it aside, uh, I'm not criticizing the data. Um, still, uh, the authors decided to test a different thing. If that theoretical idea about black hole growth uh, due to the expansion of the universe, if this theoretical idea can explain these observations, and what are some consequences? I underline the word some. So they did it, and it fits. So it is possible to explain this strange feature in a sample of supermassive black holes in elliptical galaxies with this theoretical idea. Perfect. What else did they study? They um, tried to realize if it is possible in this framework to obtain omega lambda equal to 0 0.7. Um, so it's part of the standard lambda CDM model. And uh, then they have to take into account different black holes, not only these um, supermassive black holes in elliptical galaxies. So um, it is important to take into account normal black holes formed from stars. So they took the stellar um, uh, formation, uh, star formation rate in the universe and they calculated if uh, it fits. It is possible to fit. 
So it is possible to take um, stellar mass black holes, uh, that theoretical model, and obtain omega lambda about 0 0.7. Uh, so be, uh, basing on these two things, two and a half, uh, they published that paper. However, uh, let's try to criticize it briefly. Uh, the theoretical framework is not very popular, um, and uh, that's, it's not, of course, a very critical approach. Yeah? But, but still, it's not something that uh, all theorists uh, easily swallow. Uh, that one thing. But um, I want to criticize it more on the astrophysical point of view. Uh, the first thing is related to the primordial black holes. In most of uh, cosmological models, early in the universe, basically during the first second, uh, there were conditions for black hole formation due to fluctuations of density in the early universe. Again, I underline that it's a feature of nearly all reasonable models, or maybe of all reasonable models. So uh, primordial black holes might be formed. They can have different masses from Planck masses up to roughly 10 to 5 solar masses, and they can be very abundant. They're not discovered, but still, um, their, density, their total uh, contribution to the density, uh, to the cosmological density, can be really high, and for quite a long time, they were considered as a very good candidate for the dark matter. Even now, there are people who uh, assume that um, primordial black holes can explain the dark matter. In this case, you need a very tricky shape of the mass uh, spectrum, but it is possible to do it, at least in principle. It's not forbidden. And so these black holes might be much more abundant than any other type of, of black holes in the universe. And in the paper uh, we're discussing, the word primordial is not even mentioned. I think that any significant contribution from primordial black holes will close that model um, proposed in that paper just immediately. Uh, then there are other problems uh, with stellar mass black holes because growth by a factor of 1000 uh, since uh, redshift 10, this, that's a lot, um, I, I'd like to say. And we do not see significant traces of it. We do not see massive black holes in binary systems in our galaxy. So if uh, black holes e even take, let, let's be very conservative, um, black holes might be more massive than neutron stars. So this um, means that uh, their minimal masses are about three solar masses, maybe slightly below. So if early in our galaxy black holes were formed and they had masses like two three solar masses, let's say three, then um, up to now they might have masses of tens of solar masses, many tens of solar masses. And we don't see such black holes in uh, our galaxy. We uh, know many accreting black holes. Some of them have low mass companions, which means that these systems are old. For some, there are even uh, age estimates, quite conservative, uh, and they produce large ages. So during such a long history, these um, black holes might grow, but we don't see that effect. Uh, oppositely, uh, in the gravitational wave data, we see um, massive black holes with masses up to 100 solar masses um, formed early, relatively early in the universe, so in some faraway galaxies. And we explain it by uh, low metallicity of their progenitors. Uh, in the model proposed in that paper, there is another effect which is expected to be stronger. We might see more massive black holes in coalescence closer to us, but this effect is not observed. So in my opinion, the, the paper is interesting. Okay, uh, There is an interesting theoretical idea, there is an interesting observational result, people try to put it together. That's part of normal science. And just don't be too enthusiastic about um, such ideas. Of course, the idea is very catchy. So I understand journalists who just rushed to uh, write talk about it. And as you see, I'm also mm, talking about it. 
but still uh, let's be more accurate more conservative and uh, do not cry uh, do not shout shout out erica um, in such moments uh, moments are interesting but um, more studies are necessary in this case okay so that's it. I briefly uh, described you four interesting papers published in February, and I hope more interesting papers are coming in the second half of my month. Goodbye.